Hi, my name is Nikita Coulomb, and today I'd like to share with you one way to create a batik effect on canvas with oil paint. Unlike traditional batik methods, where you would first apply wax to a piece of fabric, submerge the fabric in color dye, let it dry, and then remove the wax with heat such as an iron, with this method, you would first apply paint to the surface of the canvas, pour on wax while the paint is still wet, letting it dry, and then removing the wax to reveal a white surface underneath. Here I'm working on a painting called Lift Off and what you're looking at is right after I remove the wax off of the painting. And so it had probably been sitting for about three to five days while I was letting both the paint and the wax dry. During this time, the wax absorbed the oil paint. I've experimented with a few different mediums and it doesn't matter if you're using water soluble oils or regular traditional oil paints, the effect will be the same. The wax will pick up the paint. After I removed the wax from the painting, I hung it back up on the wall and I applied more paint to the canvas. I made some areas darker, left some areas white, and did a combination of adding more wax, taking it off, adding more paint, um, and of course letting everything dry in between so that I could get really interesting layers of color. And I'm actually only using one color in this painting, ultramarine blue. So this is how Lift Off turned out. And now I'll walk you through the materials that I use. So if you want to try this at home, you can. I'll add the links to the description of the video so that you can purchase them directly. This is the wax melter and it's pretty easy to use. You just plug it in when you want it on and then you unplug it when you want it off. It's got 10 aluminum cups and I will fill them with soy wax flakes and that's what I'll use to distribute wax across the canvas. The soy wax takes about 10 minutes to melt. I like using this wax because it's inexpensive and it's easy to remove with a palette knife. Other waxes, like paraffin or beeswax, they tend to stick a little bit more to the canvas, and that might be okay if you want wax left over on the surface, but I like to remove it all, so I stick to the soy wax. You can see here how I'm pouring wax onto the canvas with the little aluminum cups. This definitely is not the only way to do this. I'm trying to create splashes, and that's why I'm using a greater amount of wax. If you want more specific lines, you can use the Batik pens, and I'll add a link to that below. You can even use candles if you want perfect little circles dropped onto your canvas. One thing I've tried that's a little different and also can create interesting effects is using layers of acrylic paint underneath the layers of oil paint. So here you can see I'm using a layer of beige and then black acrylic paint I'm then applying black oil paint on top of that, and then I'm dripping candle wax on top of all of it, and the candle wax will only pick up the oil paint. I wanna share with you a couple of other paintings I've done that utilize different variations of this technique. What you're looking at here is Whispers 1, and I've only used black paint but I've used different kinds of black paint. So there's black acrylic paint and black oil paint. Uh, you always wanna put acrylic paint underneath your oil paint. So I'll put the acrylic down first and then I add layers of black oil paint, put wax on, take the wax off, put more oil paint on, take the oil paint off with wax. Uh, and this painting is called Portal 10 and I just did variations of acrylic and oil again in here uh, with wax on, wax off, and as you can see, I'm blending black, purple, and blue all together to kind of create an ocean effect. So I think this covers most of the basics. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below, and I hope I have the answer. I discovered this through trial and error. Um, and I'm sure if you play around a little bit, you will discover your own methods and something that complements your way of working. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and let me know if you try it, how your results turned out.
Okay, well, without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's panelists and have them just do a brief introduction of themselves and then we'll kind of jump into the conversation. So we have, I'll list them all first and then I'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves. So we have Daniel C. Walker, we have Etika Pacha, we have Adri Norris, Grow Love, as well as A.L. Grime. Yay, thank you for being here. And um, Danielle, if you'd like to start by introducing yourself, that would be lovely. Unhappy wash day me takuyapi, Danielle C. Walker Amachiapi, Mahung Papa Lakota, now Standing Rock Sioux Nation in Mahata, Denver, Colorado, Elwati. Greetings, everybody. Good evening. My name is Danielle C. Walker. I am Hunkpapa Lakota from the Standing Rock Sioux Nation, but reside here currently in Denver, Colorado. I'm an artist, a writer, a mom, and work um, in, amongst the community. My passion lies within community work. I'm a, the chair of the Denver American Indian Commission through the city and county of Denver. Um, of course, I'm uh, one of the newest board members of Streetwise and so excited to be part of that Boulder community. Um, and I'm also starting a Indigenous creative collective in the Dairy Art Center um, within Boulder. And I'm really excited to bring an Indigenous um, centric um, program to, to the Boulder community. Thanks for having me here. Thank you, Danielle. Can um, Pacha, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Erika Pacha. I go by Pacha and I live in Boulder, Colorado. I am a photographer who primarily works with women, women's empowerment. And I do large scale photographic paste up murals that I create with different folks from the community. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been weaving my work into social arts and social practice. So working with communities of indigenous activists, this year I'm gonna be working with undocumented immigrants and with um, refugees to create large scale representations of um, their communities that give them voice and give them um, a platform to be able to share their stories. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Pacha. All right, Adri, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, what's up? My name is Adri Norris. I am a portrait and mural artist here in Denver uh, for the last well, five years now. I've been focusing on portraits of women in history. And so that is what the vast majority of my work is about because that is a subsection of the society and half of our society that is largely ignored, overlooked, uh, and so on. So um, elevating the voices of women and elevating the voices of um, people who are marginalized and putting them up in places where folks can see, ask questions and learn things, whether they wanted to or not. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Adri. Uh, I also forgot to mention that you could also, if you'd like to mention, um, if you have a mural from last year's Streetwise, Boulder, where, where people can find that. And Adri, yours is on the wall at um, Lolita's, right? Yeah, the wall of Lolita's and Pacha, you have yours on the fence at, um, on, what street is that? Uh, 20, 28? On Folsom in between Pearl and Canyon on the Mr. Pool fence. Yeah, cool. And next, Grow Love. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. Uh, I'm a mural artist and a commissioned painter. I, um, I focus a lot of my work actually towards Grow Love International, which is an organization that I founded in 2018 to support, mentor um, female femme identifying uh, non-binary artists. Uh, to be able to um, uh, be able to walk into the world um, of mural art. Um, I am co-founder of the Bay Walls Mural Festival, um, which will be going into our second year this year. 
and um, I, I believe I was in the Streetwise Mural Festival first year, and I worked with Chelsea Lewinsky and the designer store. And we, I can't remember what street we're on, um, but we did a wonderful mural um, about, um, um, it had Autumn Peltier and um, Greta Thunberg in it. And it was um, uh, focusing on climate, climate crisis, the climate crisis. So, um, so yeah, um, uh, I think that's it. I apologize for my setting. I'm working on a mural project right now. So um, that's why I'm in my car, but thank you so much. Thank you. All right, and finally we have A.L. Grime. Hi guys, uh, my name is Ali. I paint under the name A.L. Grime and um, my work focuses on women's empowerment as well, um, or just really uplifting communities whose voices have been kind of silenced. Uh, I'm working on a project right now that seeks to reclaim space uh, in gentrified neighborhoods in order to retell the stories of folks who are being pushed out of that space through augmented reality and street art. So I'm excited to be building that and using technology to give voice, voices back and power back to communities who are losing it because of funding. Um, and I have murals all over Denver. And I painted for Streetwise on the back of the Boulder on the back of the Fox Theater, excuse me with uh, just and uh, our piece was also tech inspired. We wanted to celebrate uh, black female engineers uh, who often get overlooked and are maybe not thought of in that way very often. But there are so many very powerful, intelligent, not voices in places like NASA um, and a lot of other large tech inspired spaces. So yeah, my, I uh, come from the music industry. So I've really just been doing a lot of work for the last three years, similar to Grow Love, just preparing folks who are going to face uh, some pushback in their careers, teaching them how to hold their ground, how to carry themselves professionally in some of those situations that they will inevitably face uh, and mentoring young women entering the music space and now entering the art space specifically uh, focusing on art and tech in spaces like augmented reality and now with the craze with NFTs as well. Awesome, thank you all. I'm just so excited to have you all here. You all are doing great things and um, yeah, just excited to get into the conversation. So the first thing I wanted to talk about since this is about centering emerging artists is, and I feel that you all have emerged already and um, you're really out there in the community and, and doing your thing. So I just wanna start with what, um, what was it like in the beginning, even if that's like your beginning journey as an artist, how you came to art, or maybe when you started knowing you're an artist, but really coming, um, coming out as an artist and any, any kind of personal story you have that you can share, um, possibly some like inspirations or allies that you had in that as well in the beginning. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to jump in or I can call on someone. <laughs> I don't mind jumping in. Thanks. So um, the beginning, uh, well, I, I, you know, first mural I ever did was when I was 16 years old. And then I would do a mural about every two or three years um, for the last, you know, 20 years up until about four years ago. Um, I, I, I liked doing murals, but I hadn't really, uh, I hadn't really found a uh, big in inspiration for it until a friend of mine took me into the Wynwood district in Miami. Um, I was just down there for actually a, a consciousness healthcare uh, training that I was attending and she just brought me into the Wynwood district and it, it completely changed my life. I, I had no idea that murals um, on that scale and that 
technicality really existed, or at least maybe I just wasn't, I, my eyes weren't open to it. And, uh, and really from that point on, so that was 2017, I, that's all I wanted to do. So I taught myself how to spray paint and, um, and it was, it was rough in the beginning. Um, it was hard to get um, places to paint, to practice painting. It was hard to get people to, you know, to show you a uh, technique, but, um, but I was able to, to find some friends in the community. And, um, but for the most part, you know, it was really, a lot of it had to do with um, my own, my own drive. Uh, you, you know, if you want to get into it, um, you really, you got to want it really badly. And, and you also, you do need friends. Um, so that's why I started the Grow Love International was because, um, you know, they just, first of all, there aren't a lot of females in the industry and we need more. We need far more uh, females than non-binary people uh, working in the industry. Um, and so that's why I started that, but also because um, sometimes people just don't want to share their, you know, their skills. And I, I, I have never thought that that was wise. I have never thought that that is a good idea um, because this, this type of art and this avenue of art is so brilliant and wonderful and should be shared. It should be, um, you know, everybody should know how to do this. Um, everybody should know how to paint um, on walls. I feel like that is one of the most beautiful expressions that we, we are capable of as human beings. Um, and so, um, and so, yeah, the beginning was rough, but, but definitely find your, find your, you know, find people who, who want to help you. Um, and I'm, that's, that's why I'm here. And I teach workshops. I taught a workshop for Streetwise last year, and I am hoping to do the same this year. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I just, I love that, that everyone should be able to paint on walls. I think that's so true. I mean, just picking up a paintbrush, but it seems like there's sometimes barriers there. So does anyone else have any insights? Yep. Yeah. I can share. So I started doing photography when I was in high school. And when I was in my early twenties, I lived down in what is now called the Rhino District, but then it was just a bunch of old warehouses and super run down. And we would run around with stickers and papers and like paste things up and paint things and put symbols everywhere. And it was just uh, an incredible way to just get our expression out, especially as young artists. And and that's when I really fell in love with this, this aspect of art on the streets and how art is available to everybody. And um, it's, uh, it, it really created the foundation of how it is that I live my life and that uh, creating art that's like accessible, like turning, turning alleys into galleries and turning the, the community spaces into this form of expression. And so about six years ago, I learned how to start printing my photographs really large and printing them in sections. And it's kind of like glorified wallpaper pasting, but at the same time, what it did for me is like take these very intricate photographs that are double exposed in camera and, and blew them up so big where all of a sudden there was all this new texture and details and things that I couldn't see in the smaller image and these worlds that people could step into. And it became this, this portal into, into these worlds of communication where I would have dialogues with people and, and just people coming across it on the streets and, and just having this um, this this way of being able to um, create a connection with people that I didn't even know, and and that it was accessible to everyone. That was like one of the big things that I was getting out of it at the beginning of these larger um, um, murals that I was printing. And so um, I too feel the same way about you know, like as Gro said, Gro Love said that, um, you know, it was, it was difficult to like find walls. I mean, I, honestly, I actually still have kind of a hard time finding walls sometimes, 
Um, you know, it's, it's building relationships. A lot of that's what I found it is, is like getting to know building owners, being able to like go and knock on people's doors, being able to like, you know, reach outside of your comfort zone in order to develop these, these connections with people and, and for them to trust you putting something up on, on their walls. And so, um, something that I've been really finding as the scene is growing and as streetwise is happening is like how to weave in the social conversations. So before it was like, you know, as building beautiful images of, of women in, in their, you know, deeper divine expression and, and then starting to bring that into these deeper conversations with communities that don't have a chance to speak about, um, you know, what's happening in the world as much. And what I was finding in that <clears throat> was there was just a deeper level of meaning that was starting to show up, meaning for them, meaning for me, meaning for the people who were viewing it. And, and so that's how um, it, or that's why it's become important for me to, to have this opportunity to uh, weave into the social conversation. And it's brought up all sorts of things like talking about social issues isn't just like all glorified. I mean, people have issues around these issues and I've been challenged and pushed and put down and, you know, people don't always understand why you're speaking about some of these things. And so, you know, a lot of it is like a constant learning experience on my end to really like learn, be open to learning, be open to like maybe not hearing things or hearing new things that I didn't know about before and being willing to like look at parts of myself as like a privileged white woman in America and you know how it is to bridge these cool. conversations into people's worlds and so um, I just feel like this is an awesome opportunity for all of us to create more conversation and be willing to look at ourselves and see ourselves and, and create more conversation that's going to empower us to be better humans. It looks like we have a question in the chat um, about anyone being able to speak about funding and are being paid for your art in outdoor spaces? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I feel like Pacha touched on that or will touch on the journey of that just in her youth was not getting paid to do it. It was just for fun, right? Like it was absolutely not a paid thing, but um, obviously we're with these professional artists were now in that realm. So if anyone wants to speak to that as well. Sure, I can go there. Um, well, I kind of want to roll back to the earlier question um, because mm -hmm. my approach to especially mural work is very different. Um, I grew up as a kid in the Bronx in the eighties and, you know, I saw like the graffiti and stuff all over the place. And, you know, me and my friends used to write, do bubble letters and, you know, try to figure out like what our style would be. Um, but I'm also, you know, the child of immigrants and uh, that was not something I was gonna be allowed to do. <laughs> and so um, getting caught up into that space of, you know, like respectability politics, especially that affects um, black people in the US, but if you're an immigrant, it's like doubly or triply so. Um, I knew that like running the streets and painting on walls, you know, in that way that a lot of fo folks find it organically was not going to be an option for me. But it was something that I was kind of kept track of, you know, something I was always fascinated by. Um, I would watch videos, learn the skills, but not actually be able to apply them. Um, until very recently. And it was really my studio artwork that became the segue into the mural space. Um, by that time, you know, uh, which is really, I, I would say I did the first one in about 2018, but um, really got going last year. Um, you know, I was already a professional artist. I was already selling artwork. I was already making money off of my art. And so um, being able to expand into the space of, you know, doing these large pieces on walls, doing murals. Um, that was something that sort of came as part of the business aspect of me doing that kind of work. 
And so, you know, I've been very fortunate in that the messaging of my art was something that people wanted and they wanted to see blown up at a time that everybody is, was looking for murals. You know, during the pandemic, everybody wanted outdoor things because we couldn't be inside. We couldn't be in galleries. We couldn't be in museums. Um, we couldn't be in coffee shops in the ways that we were accustomed to. And so, you know, I was actually able to just really take advantage of the circumstances that led to the sort of rise in the desirability of murals. And um, as for being paid, you know, like I was already accustomed to setting rates for things for my artwork. And so I just continue doing that. Definitely. Someone in the chat was curious why you moved to Colorado. <laughs> I moved to Colorado because, um, well, I'll just give you a very, very brief overview of my past. Uh, born in Barbados, moved to New York, uh, moved from New York to New Mexico when I was 12, went from New Mexico to uh, the military. While I was in the military, I was stationed in Hawaii. And it was from there that I decided that when I went out, got out, I was going to go to art school. And Colorado, uh, the Art Institute of Colorado was the school that had the curriculum that I wanted. So that's how I got here. And then I just stayed. I've been here since 2005. <laughs> Great. Well, um, Danielle and Ali, if you want to speak to the beginning of your, your artistry or um, the next kind of thing that we're going to jump into, which is just building a body of work. So um, if either of those things. Yeah, I'm happy to speak on mine. I also mm -hmm. have kind of a strange journey into this. Um, I went to school for, I, I'm from, grew up in Washington, DC. Um, also um, immigrated into the US when I was five, lived in Colorado very briefly at a time where my parents' accents were not very accepted in the town that we lived in. So we moved to a more culturally diverse city, Washington, DC. Um, and um, I went to school for other things and then found myself kind of in a space in my life where I was really unhappy pursuing my studies. And so I left to start kind of just trying to see what I wanted to do. And at that time I found electronic music and I really fell in love more with the community and with what was being built around it rather than just the music itself. And so I very quickly became infatuated with it and started a production team with a friend um, doing small stages to put on artists. And I was building art galleries to bring live artists into the space and to help visual artists get paid within the music sphere. Um, so kind of also just to touch on as far as getting paid, the first thing is definitely having that body of work that we'll talk about next. You know, you, you want to I don't like the word pay your dues, but you do have to show something if you wanna demand payment. So even if that means starting at home, using lower budget materials to make that do, you know, for the first two years of our production company, I built every single thing on our set by like from scratch by hand. Um, I transported everything and I, I learned how to paint by painting those sets. And then I would paint live in front of an audience at the end of it. Um, and I would say, you know, it's and in terms of that growth, you have to set really clear goals for yourself in terms of what you want to learn and how fast you're willing to learn it. Um, very quickly, building sets turned into a desire for me to continue canvas painting. I became the art coordinator for a lot of large electronic musicians, took me around the country, um, and it, it was a wonderful experience. But at some point, I felt like I wasn't being paid my worth. And I experienced a lot of pushback because I was a female in the industry where just people didn't want to listen to my ideas. So I decided I wanted to take control of my life. And I just started practicing my art intensely and would wake up every day and would paint all day and then go and work it with in my other job and come back and keep going. Um, and then two years ago, I got started painting murals uh, because I went to California with Anna Charney for a music event that I was working, watched her paint a mural and she kind of just showed me a couple of can techniques. And then from there, I just came back to Denver and started painting nonstop. Um, and I did paint a few walls for free, you know, just 
doing what I had to do to show people a couple of things. And then once I had a couple of things under my belt to show, I knew that it was time to start charging for what I was doing. And that's how I've slowly been able to build it. I think it can be intimidating for artists that are young to see people charging a lot, but you have to remember they started charging very little and they worked really hard to have proof that they deserved that higher pay grade. So that's really been my journey and also how to go about doing that as well. A ton of hard work, it sounds like. Danielle, do you wanna speak at all to um, your journey in the beginning? Sure, I um, I feel like I'm an emerging artist, so I'm learning so much just by listening to mm -hmm. other panelists. Um, I'm not a trained artist, I, I'm self-taught. I come from a family of artists. My father was an artist and we were all self-taught. Um, and so I've always, I, even as a, I've been a creative person since probably since the beginning of my existence. And, um, I can't think of a time where I wasn't always creating something in some way. Um, and I've been a very quiet, a quiet person vocally, but a very loud thinker. And, um, so the, and, and I come from a culture and a, and a community where we don't um, express emotion to each other. We don't vocalize that. So my outlet has always been to like express that through art. And I'm a multimedia artist. I only did my very first mural at Bay Balls last year. Um, and I was so scared and I had no idea. And I um, was invited by a friend, Romel. You guys might know who Romel is. She's a Denver-based abstract artist. Um, and asked me, hey, would you be, would you be, um, open to doing a mural with me. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I won't even know where to start or where to begin. But the beauty of Babe Walls is what I've learned in that journey was not only connecting with women, but women helping and supporting one another and really just helping to guide. I know I've taken some, um, some a spray can workshop with Grow Love before. I've even brought my son. And it's just really about attaching yourself to people around you to help support you and, and get out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself. Um, I've only been doing, you know, like studio work, small thing, small, you know, canvas, things like that. So, but I will say once you do a mural at me, uh, it's it's addicting. I've done several, several other murals since then. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to be paid um, on all of those. Um, I kind of the approach that I take to a lot of my art is inspired by my culture, inspired by my identity um, as a woman, as an indigenous woman, as a person of color. Um, and then this kind of walking between two worlds, you know, growing up and living on a reservation, which is, I kind of compare it to living, you know, in a um, third world island among the biggest economy on earth to now residing in a um, urban setting and having to navigate kind of both those worlds and my identity and what that means and how I keep my culture and traditions intact while residing in this contemporary um, space. So a lot of my art is um, inspired by that. And um, I, I'm always experimenting. I, I do beadwork, I do leather work, I work with bone, I work with all kinds of kind of traditional materials. And I like to fuse the two and kind of play around with that. And um, right now I'm really inspired by storytelling um, on based on historical things that have happened within um, American history, particularly indigenous American history. And so I'm doing a series of women um, and, and telling stories through each of these pieces. Um, most recently I did one about the decimation of the, Amer the Buffalo and how there was only 24 left when there was millions at one point. Um, and I'm also working on a lot of activism in terms of missing and murdered indigenous women. And that's something that I'm strongly passionate about. Um, I've always grown up wondering, is it gonna happen to me? Am I gonna be kidnapped? Am I gonna be murdered? Um, one in four indigenous women will are murdered, go murdered or missing. So it's a very high rate. Um, and I'm very strongly passionate about that. And I'm actually curating a um, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls um, exhibition that will open in May at the Dairy Art Center. So I hope everybody can maybe keep pocket that information and check that out to learn a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I'm still on a journey. I think I'll always be on a journey of learning, exploring, understanding what it means to be an artist. I never really fully feel like I, um, uh, I still, I, I still get like, I'm still in awe when people are like, I want to buy your piece. Cause I just don't feel it. I'm like mine. Why mine? I don't know. I just don't fully feel like, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird feeling, but I don't know if anybody else can relate to that, but I'm still every day in awe that somebody might be interested in what I have to create. Um, so I'm still on a journey. Thank you. Thank you. 
yeah, we'd love to check out the Dairy Center uh, exhibit you're curating. And when is that again, could you mention? It's gonna open on May 8th um, for a private viewing for people that have been personally affected and then it'll be open to the public after that. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else wanna speak about kind of building a body of work? And um, I love what Danielle is talking about, just like your own context, like your relationships, like all of the things that make you who you are who you are is what makes you an artist as well. And like, so just kind of what else has, have you had to do to kind of get your shit together for lack of a better expression and um, build a body of work? Cause I think that's something that we don't talk about as much um, is how that happens. And I think that's probably cause it's, it's not like a linear process. It's very, it can be slow and it can be like these different directions, but have there been like points when you felt like, oh, like I finally have this kind of body of work that I've worked so hard to accumulate? Yeah, I'll speak on that. Mm -hmm. um, so when I decided I knew that I just wanted to do murals, um, I, I moved to a studio space uh, that had a, uh, a shed in the back outside. And I asked the, the owners of the studio if I could utilize um, the walls in the shed so that I could um, practice. And they were more than happy to allow me to do that. So I felt very, very um, fortunate um, to be able to be in that situation where I could do that. Um, and I feel like that oftentimes is a huge barrier is, is having um, a space where you feel, first of all, as a, as a woman, where you feel safe um, painting outside um, and, um, and no one's gonna bother you and, and you're not, you know, you're not gonna get in trouble for it. Um, and that's, you know, that's where I just, I, I painted probably, you know, 10 to 20 different uh, murals on that thing and practice with letters and um, graffiti work and did that for a long time and always took pictures of it and then just kind of just saw how how my work was progressing and 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 learning from 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 what I was doing every time that I worked and then um, also yeah um, there were definitely times uh, where I was just so eager to to be doing some work in the public that I would do it for free. Um, and uh, looking back on that now, knowing what I know now, uh, like the first festival that I ever part participated in, I was definitely off roster. I was not invited to be there, but I did get permission. And, um, and I did my, my largest, my first, first large scale piece ever. And I did it in like four hours and I was, so nervous and I used like three cans of spray paint and um and it, so it wasn't good um but I also think that um you know you get creative you get really creative when you when you just want it so badly um, um but I think that um you know having these discussions about um how to support emerging artists is really important because I feel like a lot of the time um you're you're so self-involved when you're when you're first starting that you're really not thinking about um, the responsibility of of uh, being in in spaces and um, you know that that's been a, a personal journey of mine which I'd like to you know really relay and and that's why I like to mentor other other artists too because first of all like you know if you're painting in a festival you know, you know, there has to be some, there has to be a lot of respect around, around um, participating. And also, um, you know, you should get paid, like, no matter what you should get paid. Um, you know, supporting artists, no matter, you know, where they're coming from, to, to get them from the next, from this point to the next step is really, I feel like really, really important. Um, and I know that we focus that on that in Bay Walls. Um, we pair us kind of senior artists with, with emerging artists so that, um, 
so that the 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 mentorship and the the ingrained uh, you know the people are learning from each other people are teaching each other stuff it just happens so naturally and then and then people are getting paid for their time so um so um yeah i, I you know you know i just opened a new studio that's a warehouse where i finally have space to be able to um have my own workshops i've been doing workshops all over the, you know the city for um for uh, about a year now and now i'm going to really start bringing people into the studio uh, regularly that way um you know there a lot of people you know really can't invest in the expensive paint so the paint is provided the the walls provided the mentorship the the, the teaching is in you know all of it is um is a part of um you know kind of the responsibility of being a senior kind of person in the mural arts I feel at this point um but um um yeah just um finding wall finding a wall and um just saving saving as much money you can if you can um put towards spray paint or or even reaching out say I really want to do this I can't you know I can't really you know foot the bill for for the cost of this like you know people People donate um, paint to me all the time too, because they know they know that how I how involved I am in mentorship and how important that is. So um, just reach out, you know, and and don't be afraid to do so because you'll be surprised how many people really really want to help and and want to bring people into this um, into this world. So yeah. Yes, I love that. Um the mentorship aspect of, of Babe Walls and of what you're doing with your work, um, absolutely necessary and um, can be a part of your building your body of work and practice. So um, does anyone else want to speak to kind of like what your practice has looked like as an artist and how that came to be? Um, maybe involving spaces or Someone's asking about music festivals. Can Jeff speak on music festivals, especially? Okay. Um, so, oh, and mural festivals. So, um, so for music festivals in particular, there is a lot of live painting. So many incredible artists in the world have begun their painting journeys, live painting at festivals. Um, you do do it in exchange for a ticket, but you can bring your own merchandise and sell it there. Um, I, I did that for a while um, and I made sure when I was curating within music festival spaces that artists were allowed to sell their work if they were not being paid already and that they wouldn't be bothered in doing so, that they had visibility. I think it's an excellent way to get your name out. And honestly, they're one of the best networking, like just opportunities that you can have. People there are in a, they're in a positive mood. They want to learn, they want to experience art and they're so willing to patronize artists um, in those spaces. So definitely just apply, um, just like for perspective, when I first started my first, my first year, I applied to 76 things. I knew I wouldn't get into any of them and I got into one. And the year after that, I applied to every single one the second time and I got into six. And last year I applied as an artist that with a portfolio, I applied to 34 festivals and I got into five. So it really just is that hunger that Grow Love mentioned. You have to want it really bad and you have to understand that rejection is not personal. It's just an opportunity to grow within that. You know, at the beginning, I think building a body of work for me took a lot of humbling myself and understanding that because I think very large, that all these very large things I want are possible, but not tomorrow maybe in five years and maybe it's gonna take actually five or six steps to get there. And so in terms of like building my a, a body, I do so by building a narrative first. And then I try and visualize like, what are the five or six steps it would take to get to that, to this final narrative? And how can I tell that story in pockets? And then I start thinking about how do I build the network to do that? Is it a music festival? Is it a mural festival? Is it working with a partner, like a brand? that tells that story or with a group that are, you know, telling stories in the way that people are in this group. So to push that forward, um, I think just the key within that space is, is try, 
just apply to everything and, and you never know where your first opportunity is going to come from. And as long as you show up to every single opportunity with a hundred percent and you're professional and you are um, available whenever they need you, then more often than not, a lot of these people will accept you because you are easy to work with rather than the very best in the world. I know within my own curation experience, especially within festivals, festivals are so chaotic that the organizers don't wanna deal with anything. And if you're hard to deal with, they just simply won't invite you back. But if you're very eager and willing to learn and you show up and, and you give it 100%, then they're often willing to give a smaller emerging artist a huge opportunity because they feel like they deserve it. Thank you for those insights. Um, I think Adri had her hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so originally I was going to speak to the idea of building a portfolio. Um, and that was something that, especially when I was in art school, that was definitely drilled into us. Like we had to have a portfolio and a demo reel because I studied animation um, by the time we graduated. And the thing that I've learned over the years is that it's always well and good to say that I'm going to have a portfolio. But the question is, what do you want to work on? Like, what do you want your actual work to be? Because when I was an animation student, my portfolio was full of life drawings and figures studies. And um, it was full of, um, you know, just like character designs and things of that nature. Um, but ultimately, I wanted to be a fine artist and I wanted to be a portrait artist. And so I had to shift gears, you know, after doing a bunch of work that I didn't actually enjoy um, and start actually building a portraiture portfolio. Um, which then led to, you know, me doing portrait work for people. And so like painting uh, family members or couples or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and so when I got to the place where I am now, which is where I'm predominantly working on images of, you know, women in history, um, my portfolio was basically me booking an art show. And so once I book a show, then I've got to create a whole new body of work in order to fill the show. And so that's actually how I've been portfolio building over the years. I just basically book a show and then have to create a new body of work or add to an existing body of work in order to be able to have something to hang out the walls because they're expecting me. Like I am one of, you know, they're usually one a month in the coffee shops that I show at. Um, so I'm one of 12 artists who gets to show in this space and I better do the thing that I said I was going to do. Um, and so that is the, the route that I took. And the thing that I think is really valuable about, you know, building portfolio by doing a show as opposed to building a portfolio by doing client work is that number one, I'm in charge of it. I can show everything, you know, there's nobody who's saying, hey, I love what you did, but don't show my kids to the world. Um, that's number one. But number two is I'm also very much in control of how I choose to work. And so the murals that I get to do now are very much based on my most recent portfolio building, which is the series that I did called Women Behaving Badly. And so everything that I get to do moving forward has to do with that work because I built it up. And so even segueing from studio work into mural work, um, I didn't have much mural work to show, but I could show that I could paint. I could show that I could nail a likeness. I could show that I could put ideas together in an interesting way that people wanted to see. And so, although I didn't have walls to practice on necessarily, I just kind of hit the ground running. Um, I did have the ability to at least put together the concept of being able to do murals. And the other thing is I don't use spray cans. I use brushes just as I do with my studio work, just much bigger brushes. And so that was an easier segue for me to get into that space. Um, but, you know, that's my personal choice. Uh, if you want to use cans, use cans. If you want to use brushes, use brushes. If you want to use stencils, use stencils, do your thing. Yes. I love that you're speaking to um, just kind of creating accountability processes for yourself where it's like you apply and you have to do it because, you know, you're holding yourself accountable. Um, yeah. Anyone else? want to speak to yeah pacha awesome so i'm gonna hit on 
all of these things. Um, first around the funding question that came up earlier. So I have, um, I have an interesting view on funding. And um, I think we can all relate as artists that uh, for, and I can speak for myself, that as an artist, I, um, I wear a different hat every day. Like some days I'm hustling this and some days I'm hustling that. And it just depends on what kind of gigs that I have. And so it, at least that's been my arts career is that I do a lot of different things. And so I started out in the underground arts and I was all about community building. And then in my early twenties, I, um, I wanted to become an artisan because in, in my early years of the underground arts, I just didn't really like understand how to, how to sell work. And I didn't want to become a, a part of like the art scene. I was like, you know, more rough and tumbly with it. And so I became an artisan and I started making clothing and creating one of a kind clothing. That's when I got into the festival world. I started selling at festivals and, and that's when I also started uh, becoming a part of um, building installations and doing large scale art and, you know, plugging myself into all these different platforms. And so um, up until last year, any given time, I would be like running clothing production for companies. I'd be running my own clothing production and selling at stores. Um, I haven't been doing festivals for many years, at least in clothing, but I've been doing murals at festivals. And, um, but then uh, a big part of how I also work as a photographer is I do client work. And so that's a big part of how I fund my life. And then when it comes back into doing murals, like, you know, I, I now, if I'm getting a professional gig, I definitely ask for funding. If there's, um, you know, a, a, a building owner, if somebody asks me to put something on a container, anything like that, it's like getting the funding to fund the project. But I also still hit the streets pretty regularly and put up free art all over the place. Like I'm all about putting art out into the world. Like, yes, I believe in artists getting paid for their work, but I also believe in putting free art out on the streets. And to be honest, there's certain things I can do that way that I can't do on a funded wall. And so I try to balance out both sides. And so now in the last couple of years, especially doing social art projects, I've been looking at new ways of getting these projects funded. And one of those, um, in the current state is, is um, this new world that I know Ali is a part of as well is NFTs and the whole art world is like taking this whole new direction of how artists are getting their work direct to collectors. And I'm really interested in this aspect of how it is that we can find ways to fund not just our own personal work, but to fund social practices and social arts out in the world. So that's something that I'm really interested in right now is um, I'm about to launch my first NFT. And the, the main reason I wanna use that platform is to take a percentage of that to be able to fund mural projects because I know that there's a lot of people out there, building owners who don't necessarily um, you know, maybe they have the money to fund, but they don't necessarily have the, uh, the ability to, or they want to put money into it. And so that's one of the things that I really love about what Leah is doing and what I love about what the festivals are doing is they're really, um, making that conversation happen of like how important it is to actually fund the arts and fund the artists. And so that's one of the things that um, I've gotten from all the music festivals I've worked at and um, any of the mural arts festivals is that they always fund every, they always pay the artists and really speak to how important that is and have created more of a conversation around that. So um, one, I just thank you, Leah, and, and um, those who are putting that conversation out there. Um, and then as far as building a body of work, like, I think there's so many different ways of doing it. And you know, one of the, the things that just feels important to say is just to 
to just make as much work as you can and just to keep like churning it and putting it out there and trying new things. And then, then like slowly through that, you start collecting like things that start to match each other and starting to put it this way and that way. And to me, it's like a puzzle piece and it's always changing and growing. And I have work that's in there. That's like from, you know, 10 years ago, but that influences now and then take that one out. And now this one goes in and now it's starting to turn into all murals. And, you know, so it's, um, if anything, I find the body of work thing to be just really inspiring and to just kind of like help me reference where it is that I'm going and growing and how it is that I can actually ins feel inspired by putting my work out into the world. Awesome. Maybe we can just talk a little bit about um, community because as you mentioned, Pacha, there's kind of this growing scene in Boulder and in Denver um, and maybe about some of the struggles you've had or um, just great partnerships you've had, um, anyone want, you wanna shout out in the community. But I think we talk about community a lot and it gets a little bit lost as like this bigger community, but a lot of times it's it's really about these like personal relationships. So there's something to be said about that as well. And um, yeah, does anyone have any thoughts? I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, um, networking is really important and um, just, you know, showing up. Like, I remember when I was first starting, um, really getting out there, I was going to like every single possible arts event that I knew of. Um, so like on the first Friday art walk, I was going to like five or six different spots around town and um, everything that I heard about, I would go to and really trying to find, you know, find my people, find other people who um, were working in, in the mural art, art field who, um, who, you know, because everyone, we talk about what we're doing and what's going on and what's happening. And, um, and so um, that was really, really helpful um, for, for getting my face out there too. I know that's a little bit more difficult in the pandemic right now. Um, so, but there still are, um, you know, gallery openings and things like that. So, so finding, you know, finding where, where, where the people who are doing things that you are looking at doing, find, you know, find where those um, people are showing their art and where they might be gathering and just kind of talking to people, just get out there and start talking to people. Um, that's, that really helped. Um, um, what else was I going to say? Um, Mm. Well, I can't remember now, but um, that for like a year, I did that for an entire year and I was exhausted after that year. I was completely spent, but it, you know, that's kind of like the way that I work as an artist. I, I kind of like put things in little boxes where I'm like, okay, this is, I'm going to dedicate myself. I'm going to focus on this and do this for a year usually my time frame that I work from so like when I was learning how to spray paint I knew that I needed to kind of stop working with brushes to really dedicate myself um, to learn so I told myself I wouldn't pick up um, a paintbrush for a year I would only use spray paint even though I wanted to so badly and take the easy route out because I was you know I was a great um, painter with brushes um, but that was my way of being like okay this is how I'm going to get good and this is how I'm going to really build my body of work is to, to, you know, really dedicate myself. So it's like, it, it's finding the things that you believe will help um, and really dedicate yourself um, to, to that as, as much as you possibly can. Um, what was the other uh, thing that you were talking about? Um, I think just community and different relationships maybe. Oh. Yeah, so when you're, um, I wanted to just say, you can, you know, if you have something in your mind that you're envisioning, um, just just talk to other people about it. It's likely there are other people thinking the same thing. So um, when I met Alex 
Alexandra Pangburn, who's the other co-founder of Baywalls, um, I I remember she had hired me to do this project with the Rhino Arts District. And at that point, I, all I was talking about was about how um, all the female and non-binary artists uh, in Denver needed to get together and, and paint together and do murals together because um, because there was an accessibility issue that I was seeing coming up, and a lot of a lot of artists were talking about this, and I was I was listening because, you know, usually if you're finding um, trouble with something, you're not the only one who's experiencing this. So, I literally would tell anybody who would possibly listen to me, we need to get all of us, you know, female artists, all of us non-binary artists, and we need to start working together because right now we. We, we felt divided. We felt like we were all out here working, but nobody was really working with each other. I mean, it was very like, we, we felt very separated. So it's like, we need to get together. So at that point I, I said, okay, for a year, I'm only doing work where I'm collaborating with other artists. I wasn't doing any of my own work. I was only doing work if it was a collaboration with somebody else. And that, I, I recommend doing that uh, as a practice anyways, because uh, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful practice in, uh, in collective consciousness and how to really take your ego out of, out of, um, design work, take your ego out of, um, you know, application method, of you know, final product. You, it's, it's a beautiful practice in, in letting go of, of expectations, um, and really, and, and really learning from other people too. So, um, so yeah just talking like whatever whatever you feel like you think needs to happen just say it you know because likely there are going to be people around you who who feel the same way and who want to be involved in the same thing so um find your people you know awesome i feel like that leads really well into just the idea of um art and activism and um there's something interesting that I wanted to bring up from our last panel where Greg Deal, um, an indigenous artist, had said that he's an artist first. And then when I have an opinion, suddenly that makes me an activist. He said, what one person calls an activist, the other would call an adult with an opinion. Um, and I could, you could elaborate that to say like an adult with any kind of struggle. So <laughs> I just think it's interesting, this idea of the accidental activist. And I feel like um maybe you all can relate <laughs> does anyone want to speak to what it has looked like yeah adri yeah so um i also kind of stumbled into activism <laughs> and uh really it's because you know i enjoy educating people uh i always have when i was what second grade i learned where babies come from and then i told everybody in my class so you know i've always been that kid <laughs> who was like, hey, I've got some information to share. Let me share it. Um, and recently I started using my artwork as a way of doing it. And all of a sudden people see me as an activist. I'm like, oh, I was just sharing some shit I learned, but all right, let's do this. Um, and, you know, I love that idea of, yeah, just falling into it. But once you fall into it, then you, you know, have to take the choice uh, and embrace it. And I think that, especially as artists, we have this responsibility to um, really look at the world around us and either reflect it back or envision a different one because that's the ability, that's our superpower, right? Because other people um, don't necessarily have that level of vision or at least not in that literally visual way. You know, they can talk about a better future, but we can actually show people what that looks like. Um, and so that's something that I think we should really um, think about and, you know, ideally embrace as artists. And so um, when I made my shift from just doing um, client work, you know, and showing people what they thought they wanted to showing people what I felt was important, um, it took a little while, you know, like I did this whole body of work. I did 10 pieces and then I stopped for the better part of a year because I had jumped back into client work and I was like, yo, I got to make this money. Um, but then I realized that I'd ignored that whole body of work for so very long. 
And so I said, okay, finally, I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to do anything that's not this. Um, and that's where a shift in my career took place. Like I took a financial hit for a good chunk of time um, in that transition. But once I came out on the other side, it was, you know, a whole new game. And so that's something that I recommend for people as well um, as they're developing um, their bodies of work, as they're building communities, you know, um, with my work, I realize that because I'm educating, then the people that I need to speak to are educators. And it kind of happened naturally where I have friends who are teachers, they would come to my shows. During my shows, I would speak about my artwork and they were like, hey, can you come and do that with my kids, you know, in the classroom? And then that turned into giving talks, that turned into being on podcasts, that turns into all kinds of different ways of doing the exact same thing that I was doing, just standing in front of, you know, my audience at my art show. And so that allowed me to get into spaces um, and to network uh, in ways where now I get to show in museums, which are also places of education. Um, and so like it's expanded my world because once I said, this is my group, this is my people, um, I realized that my people are in more places than I originally thought. I'll, put, I'll speak to activism. I, I think we, you know, I, some people have said that they are an artist first and activism sec, an activist second. I think it's the other way around for me. I think um, I grew up around activists. I've been on the front lines, I've been, you know, in protests and all kinds of things my entire life and still am. And um, have realized that through art, you can actually gain a wider audience to spread your message. And so um, I have found kind of the opposite. It was through activism, I found art and how, especially on a larger scale, muralism, things like that, you can really capture audiences that maybe wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to certain topics or certain pieces of activism. Um, and so I kind of mentioned I was working on missing and murdered indigenous women and I've been doing a lot of that through my art. A lot of my other art is just um, has messages and almost all of the pieces that I create have some sort of intent, um, particularly some type of activism behind them um, and inspired by them. And um, sorry, my screen went blank. I don't know, is it, are you guys still there? We're here, I don't, we lost oh. the video. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, whoops. Anyway, um, so yeah, I guess that's really just what I wanted to say about that is that I kind of, it was the opposite for me was that um, activism has kind of been at the first and forefront for, of my existence. I mean, I think my existence in general is a piece of activism, right? Our, my people shouldn't even be here today. So, um, and my, one thing that has stuck with me my entire life is that my dad has always told me, um, Danielle, if you don't speak up, nobody's going to do it for you. And so that has really, really stuck with me and um, has really inspired my activism. I love that. I love that you both, you and Adri both have these kind of vice versa journeys, but it's still like a transition towards your purpose and um, really just going for that when, you know, it, you've been in one thing for a long time. It doesn't mean you have to stay in that. Um, would anyone else like to speak about art and activism for them? May, may I add something to that too? So I think mine kind of happened by accident as well. Um, when I left school and began my journey, um, I myself struggled with addiction. And then I found this community in electronic music that didn't shame me for the way that, for what I had struggled with and really embraced me. And so that's what I fell in love with was, um, people who had built a space so safe that for the first time in my life, I got to be myself. And that's what I, my quote unquote activism within that space started with just building a safe space for people to come and feel like they could release themselves because no one would hurt them there. No one would judge them there. And then that later transitioned into me seeing you know, working within that space, then I saw this need for, okay, now we need to find representation for visual artists. And then that became kind of my focus. And then later watching how other females are being treated within the space um, or people of color within the music industry, how they were treated differently than others, then I kind of expanded even further into that. I think 
you know, it can be something if it's deeply rooted within you and your culture that can come very early, or it can be something that just builds it within your experience. I think if you're working with intention and that the intention of your work is always to just leave a space or leave a community more beautiful mm -hmm. than when you came in, then naturally everything you do is activism because you're standing up for hope and for love and for choosing to do the good thing or the right thing instead of the wrong thing. And naturally then without even trying, you're building communities, you're bringing people together who think like you do. Um, and, and later on in my work within um, murals and stuff, um, and just art in general, I've shifted again to speak, uh, continue to just speak for women and make space for women who maybe otherwise um, are being silenced or being treated in a way that I think is different than others. And so that's also just been super natural. It's been easy for me. It's what I believe. Anyone who will listen, I will always preach equality for all, especially within the arts. And so it just really felt natural for my art to also have that message. And at the end of the day, I, I don't believe that anything is created for art's sake. I believe that the act of creating for art's sake is rebellion. That's saying that you don't believe in the structures that exist in society. And so all everything we do as creatives is created with an intention. And if we can just identify that within ourselves, then we can really just shape a more beautiful world for everyone. Thank you, that's very powerful. I'll speak to activism. So the way that it showed up for me is when I was young, I, I, I think it was more of like that punk rock side that just like had something to say, was pushing against the world and it was pushing against me. And it was a lot about like identity and self-discovery. And so hitting the streets at a young age and, you know, putting things on the walls and, and communing with the community was this, this form of, of like understanding who I was in the world and understanding who the world was in relationship to identity. And, and then as I grew older and started creating more work and started finding that like, oh, what is it to like actually like weave meaning? So that's one thing to just to, to, to create something beautiful, but what is it to like actually create something that has meaning that speaks to this greater message and use these platforms, use our voice, use our energy, use our drive. And so that's where a lot of that fuel started to come up inside of me as this like bridge to, to speak about things that were happening in the world. And, and part of that started to come up initially in injustice, like uh, speaking about all the things that are happening in the world. And I, I feel like that's important, but now I'm also starting to realize that it's um, important to, to use those platforms to celebrate. So to celebrate how people are living their lives, like not just about the things that are going wrong with them, but the things that are going right. And like, and that's where the empowerment piece came in. And, and, and the more that I stirred that empowerment in myself and in other women, and, and then all of a sudden it was like, you know, that frequency vibration started growing. And, and so it's using activism as a, a way to inspire and to create change through this this uh, aspect of um, empowerment. And so I, I try to like weave both in where it's like the stories uh, definitely speak to the, the issues that are going on because I feel like that's super important. And simultaneously, how do we celebrate the beauty, the beauty of these women, the beauty of these cultures, the beauty of these gifts that people have to share. And, um, and I feel like part of that has been at least inspiring for me in that like sometimes I think that our whole world is inundated with so much like negativity that it's almost difficult to like understand or realize like what's happening but to use beauty or creativity as a platform that then like seed messages in so then people start to like they're like kind of like opened up in awe and in, inside of that awe, then, then you can like plant messages like, oh, this is what's happening with these people. And, oh, this is what they're experiencing. And so it's kind of like a different pathway into their, their consciousness that allows them to receive the information. Yes. Art is powerful. 
and it can be very vulnerable too. I think like that's what you're saying, Pacha, is it's like this opening up. It's like people are feeling things when they see your work and that's a vulnerable place where we can all kind of meet on the same terms. Well, I think we're gonna come to kind of last thoughts. So if each artist wants to speak to kind of um, something, some tidbit of information that you'd like to leave with, you know, your younger self as an artist or just um, <laughs> Adri's ready. So I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, I tell this to every parent who tells me that their kid loves art. I tell them, yes, that is amazing. Please encourage that in them, foster that as much as you can, and then send them to business school. Because as much as I got out of going to art school and learning all of these tools and stuff like that, I, I'm personally the kind of individual who is self-motivated and I would have learned that anyway. And honestly, there was a lot of stuff that I learned before school and that I learned after school. Um, but business, man, that one beat me up for so long. Um, and it wasn't until I actually started to take courses and learn about finding your niche and learn about getting your separate business account and learn about putting money aside for taxes and all of these other things that um, they did not teach me in art school. Um, that was when things shifted and I get to do this full time. I know that's not everybody's pathway, but if you want it to be your path, learn business. Yes. <laughs> Grow Love, do you have some final thoughts for us? Sure. Uh, I definitely, I second that. Uh, take some uh, business, marketing, Anything that's gonna that's gonna really really help you because uh, you know for the most part it's it's you doing everything and uh, and having the having the knowledge um, is really important uh, you know or you could you know stumble and uh, <laughs> I mean I think all artists stumble their way through being a, a working artist. Uh, but um, if you can make it, make it a little easier for yourself and, and do things like that, um, I definitely recommend it. Training, workshops, you know, any, any little thing that'll just give you, you know, take a couple, maybe a year or two off of your own personal learning curve. Um, do, do it. Uh, invest in yourself. It's huge. I mean, it, it, sometimes it's really hard to, uh, to, to rationalize. Uh, spending money on, you know, on things like that, but you're going to get it back tenfold. Um, you're going to get all that back tenfold. Um, so, so it'll, you know, it'll, it'll work for you. Um, other things I just want to say as a last little note is, um, you know, uh, sometimes artists just, um, naturally kind of feel outcast um, that can, um, when you're really, when you're starting something new, um, or, or not new and you're stumbling through it, you can feel that way. So, um, so just, just remember that, um, that you're, you know, you're here in a divine form. You were given the gifts that you were given. You were given the knowledge and the willpower to do what you're doing for a reason. Um, so trust that within you, uh, love yourself, put yourself first above above all other things, um, you know, don't work yourself to death, you know, really take care of your body, wear protective gear that you need to, if you're using spray paint, if you're using oil paint, you know, you know, wear, you know, take care of your body, because this is, you know, mural art, being, doing public art is, is grueling, it can be very grueling, so take, you know, do, sign up for your yoga classes, do, do whatever you need to do, take care of your back, your bones, your, health, eat good food, don't eat crap, you know, I'm like a mom too. So like, obviously I'm going to say this kind of stuff, but, uh, but yeah, love yourself, take care of yourself. Like you would your, your best friend or your mom or your sister or your brother, or whoever, you know, take care of yourself like that first. Thank you. Danielle, final thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I echo everything that, that um, Grow Love and Adri said, especially the business aspect. I'm still learning the ropes on that. Um, but one thing I wish I would have told myself, you know, a decade ago, or even when I really started getting serious about art is, I wish I would have put myself out there more and maybe networked with people and what and wasn't afraid to just ask for advice. I kind of kept to myself and, and had this mindset of, you know, oh, wow, I really admire all these community artists and all these great organizations, but, you know, and I, I wish I could pick their brain. Well, I wish I would have just done that and reached out and did that sooner than later, because what I found since I've done that um, has just opened so many doors and people are willing to help you. People are willing to mentor you. People are willing to want to help lift, uplift you. And if they're not, they're not the right people you want to be around. So people that really, truly um, are good people will want to help you. And I just encourage that. I mean, I don't feel anybody that wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to help in any way that I can. And I know everybody on this call is willing as well. So that's one little tidbit I would, I would say. I love that. It can be so scary to reach out, but um, I think that sometimes we're most scared that something is actually going to happen and we're going to have to like work for it and learn. So um, a lot of people do want to help. So thanks for speaking to that. Um, Allie. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I think I just want to second everything everyone has said. Definitely, Adri, hit the nail on the head. Learn the business side of it as much as you can at the beginning. Um, and just like ask other artists for it. I have I think our other creatives are a little bit more willing to share the business side uh, or just like tips in terms of structuring that than maybe giving you all of their art tips right away. So just ask for help. Most people are super willing to. Um, I think the first, the most important thing you can do is just find your voice. For me, art has always just been a journey into figuring out who I am and why I do the things I do. And in moments where I've maybe been rejected for things, it hurts a little bit more when you invest yourself so personally, because you feel like, oh, well, I'm being rejected for me. But I think it's important to just remember that um, we as creatives have a gift where we actually get to share a piece of ourselves with the world every single day. And so no matter whether or not that's received in the way that we wish or that we would want, we still are blessed to get to do that. And so I, I in, on top of everything everyone else has said, I would say practice gratitude for yourself for your body, for your mind, for the opportunities that you have and, and take every opportunity you can to pay it back. Um, because there's a little kid out there who was just like you at the beginning and, and they're just looking for that one person to give them a shot. And that's it. Totally. Yeah, we need to invest in the youth and they're gonna be the future if we want to keep creating art communities, so. Pacha. <laughs> yeah, I say the same as, as everyone. I think these are all super key, important pieces, business, self-care, gratitude, love, community, connection. And I think I just want to add to it just the, 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 the art is, is an experimental and experiential practice and to just be willing to try new things, to step into the unknown, to like push against the threshold of, of what you think is possible because it just like keeps taking us places. It's the imaginal realms, like anything is possible. And the more that we push into these spaces and places, the more we find our voice, the more that we find our inspiration, the more that we connect to people. And, and I know that that's a huge journey. I mean, like just being able to find confidence in, in myself and my journey has taken most of my life. And, and yet it comes through uh, stepping into the unknown and being willing to try things that maybe I didn't try before. And each time I do it, I'm like, wow, it's amazing. And, and to me, that's like one of the most uh, incredible parts of creating and getting to do what any of us get to do is we get to like create awe in the world. And we all got there by trying new things and pushing ourselves and stepping into new territory. And so that's, that's the, that's the like seed nugget that I really, um, you know, pass on is, is just be willing to press the threshold. Thank you.
Thank you.